नमस्कार वेलकम लर्नर्स एंड स्कॉलर्स ऑफ संग मुख कोर्स एथिक्स थ्योरीज एंड एप्लीकेशंस फॉर द नेक्स्ट 25 टू 30 मिनट्स आई एम गोइंग टू स्पीक ऑन एथिक्स इन द हिस्ट्री ऑफ इंडियन फिलोसॉफी विथ रेफरेंस टू वैदिक पीरियड धर्मशास्त्र इतिहास पुराना ट्रेडिशंस एंड भगवत गीता आई एम नंदिनी सिन्हा कपूर अ प्रोफेसर विद द स्कूल ऑफ interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary study at Indira Gandhi National Open University you have already been introduced to this course by my colleague Dr Ashutosh Vyas who had spoken on nature and scope of ethics so let us begin today's session what are the objectives of this particular lecture to give the students of philosophy a general glimpse of ethics in indian tradition to enable them to understand the ethical consciousness of india to enumerate various ethical concepts of different indian philosophical and religious traditions let us look at the introduction moral consciousness is an undeniable fact of human experience the moral sensibility is something essential for the peaceful society and the work even gods are believed to incarnate to restore righteousness and peace in the society down through the centuries many religious teachers and philosophers were interested in the rational ground of morality the caste duties of hindus prescribed in the dharma shastras are well articulated commands which are meant to regulate the life of the community ethics as a speculative science is best on the foundations of moral behavior of man but a substantial portion of moral codes are based on religious beliefs social customs and traditions when we take the indian ethics too the morality is very much based on certain beliefs customs and traditions of indian religion it is true that the foundations of indian ethics can be sought in the metaphysical and the theological beliefs in the form of worship prayers and in the form of ideals and principles that directed man's life in society when we speak of indian ethics we cannot deny the intimate relationship that prevails between ethics and hindu religion as such or any other religion for that matter ethics and religion are so closely related and whatever may be the religion it contains within itself some system of morality for the guidance of its followers like religion and art morality also is an institution of life for anyone to adopt in his life by this institution of morality one's actions from the moral point of view might be branded as good or bad right or wrong praiseworthy or blameful and so on and again by morality one may be entitled to judge others actions as good or bad right or wrong in this sense morality can be regarded as a particular way of looking at issues of character and conduct morality means conscious living within the frame of certain principles of conduct laid down by those regarded as authorities since the ancestors of the hindus in india were spiritual in nature they fixed their attention on a life beyond death they regarded the human soul or the inner being as an eternal entity coexisting with the supreme being they believe that every human soul goes through the round of births rebirths and reaps the fruits of action when a soul comes to be associated with the gross material body it is bound to perform certain deeds and in conformity with laws divine reaps the fruits thereof the belief is that if good deeds are performed happiness results and if evil deeds are performed misery falls to the lot of the doer the human soul never dies now let us look at the sources of moral ideals in india any human being in the society is called to live and lead a moral life to lead a moral life he needs certain guidelines and principles of morality to do certain deeds and to abstain from certain deeds what is the primary source of morality in india that is an important question where do we draw our uh, authority from or uh, inspiration from 
the command coming from which source? The answer could be the authority of the religious scriptures, especially for the Hindus that of the Vedas. After the Vedas, the authority of the Smriti is accepted. As you know, that the most famous Smriti in our society is Manu Smriti. So Vedas or Shrutis, why the Vedas are called Shrutis? Because in the ancient times, the hymns in the Vedas used to be in oral traditions. It was not written down, it was written down at a much later period. Therefore, the Veda and as a literature and the hymns are known as Shrutis in Sanskrit. Shruti means having heard or having listened to. So Shrutis and the Smritis such as Dharma Shastras of Manu taken together have been regarded as the source of morality. Of these two, you can ask which one is superior, which, is, which one of these is of higher rank. The Vedas and Smritis of the two, the Vedas are regarded as superior. So it is more than Smriti or Dharma Shastras of Manu. The very concept of Indian morality is both authority based and social reasoning. Both in Buddhism and Jainism, reason has been given a prestigious place. So we see in um, heterodox sects, these protest movements that ancient Indian society saw in the form of uh, Buddhism and Jainism as a socio-religious reform movement, rationality or reasoning was given a very prestigious place. In Jainism, right faith is given the first place among the three jewels or famously known as three ratna. One is advised to use his reason in ascertaining the validity and worth of the precepts before following them. In Buddhism too, the use of personal reason is neither disallowed nor despised. The Buddhists have a more critical way of looking at things, more analytical way of explaining any philosophical or concepts or social concepts. So for them, personal reason, rationality, reasoning are all important. In Buddhism, the four noble truths or Aryas, Satya, are to be followed. But even the Buddha says, wherever there is a disagreement, questions can be asked for removing doubts. If a rationality or if a rational being asks questions about those four noble truths, to remove doubts, questions can be asked and answered. In modern Hindu thought, reason is given a better place especially in the ideas of Swami Vivekananda and Mahatma Gandhi. Now let's come to the subtopic ethics, its meaning in Indian tradition. The Indian term for morality and ethics is dharma. So therefore dharma doesn't alone, alone mean religion. Dharma comes from the root dhri, which means to hold together. And thus the function of dharma is to hold the human society together for its stability and growth. Right conduct is essential if the human society has to survive. The dharma in Hinduism is coextensive with morality. Dharma in the Vedas refers to the highest truth and power and it is very much understood as the performance of Vedic sacrifices and other rituals in the Vedas and Dharma Shastras. So Dharma is understood in the Vedas as duty per excellence. So we, we can see that uh, it can be literally translated as far as Vedas are concerned as duty per excellence. Everybody has to perform his or her duty as per his caste status, his class status. So Dharma is also generally understood as duties of humans according to one's own caste, just now I explained that, and stage of life or Barnashrama Dharma. You remember Barnashrama Dharma, uh, that is Brahmacharya, Grahastha, Banaprastha and Sanyasa. And thus, many Hindu thinkers say, if one does his duty, he will achieve either heaven or a better birth in the next life or even prosperity here and now. Now let us very briefly look at ethics in Vedic period. When we speak of Indian ethics, its early beginnings have to be traced from the Vedas, particularly the Rig Veda, 
we are familiar with the names of the four Vedas, Rig Ved, Yajur Ved, Sam Ved and Athar Ved. So we are talking about the first Veda, Rig Veda. One of the central ethical concepts of Rig Veda is Rita, a conception of unifying order or moral law pervading all things. The concept, there is now an important concept called Rita. So Rita has given rise to two other important concepts, the concept of Dharma and the concept of Karma. The concept of dharma has got so different and divergent meanings as we have been talking about that usually we translate it as religion but we can see it is not religion, it is actually translated as uh, connotation is duty per excellence, right? One's own actions or duties. But generally it is now known as a duty. The concept karma signifies that there is a uniform moral law governing the actions of man and rewards and punishments appropriate to their actions. So let us repeat it. The concept of karma which is uh, different from dharma signifies that there is a uniform moral law governing. So karma is more to do with uniform moral law governing the actions of man and rewards and the punishments appropriate to their actions. Rita is the foundation of these two concepts. What are the, these two concepts? Dharma and Karma. The more important and essential element in the Vedic ethics is that of love and worship, bhakti, offered to gods in complete submission. So we can see that as far as Vedic ethics are concerned, it is the concept of love and worship offered to the gods in complete submission. So it's more of bhakti. The highest goal of life for the Upanishads, now we are coming to the Vedanta, Vedanta literature, end of the Vedic period or end of the Vedic literature uh, to say there is a difference between the Rig Vedic uh, moral law ethics with that of the Vedantic with the period of the Upanishad. It is in Upanishad no longer happiness as in the Rig Veda, but the liberation from bondage to the transitory existence and re-attainment of the inner essence of the soul. It is more philosophical. It is not karma kanda. It is not so much to do with the material happiness, but to free from the bondage of this material life to the transitory existence that we have and the retainment of inner essence of the soul. The Upanishadic ethics is primarily Atman centric and intellectualistic. It has to, Upanishadic philosophy and ethics have to do more with uh, intellectual exercises, mind exercises, the question and it is Atman centric, soul centric. The Upanishads declare that the Vedic sacrifices are totally irrelevant for the realization of moksha or liberation. Moksha or liberation from what? from the cycle of birth and rebirth, right? From the cycle of birth and rebirth of uh, this life and death, the birth, rebirth and death. So Upanishads declare that the Vedic sacrifices are totally, that yagna based, karma kanda, Ayurveda is full of such descriptions, what you should do, what all yagna should, you should do, what are the material you have to procure. So it is, Totally according to Upanishad, it is totally irrelevant for realization of moksha. So therefore, according to Upanishad, what is the uh, final liberation? That final happiness. The final happiness is liberation from the cycle of birth, rebirth and death and attain moksha or liberation and you merge with the supreme Atman or Paramatma. And so man is constantly exhorted to seek his individual liberation and not worry about other social or moral obligation. However, this kind of philosophical individualism definitely undermines the values of social morality. Uh, if it is denying completely the, you know, uh, social and moral obligation. So there is a problem here also that it undermines the values of social morality. For the Upanishads, the identification and realization of the soul or the self with Brahman is very important. So the uh, merging of Atman 
विथ परमात्मन इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट कॉन्सेप्ट सेंट्रल टू द उपनिषद विच इज नॉट देयर इन द ऋग्वेद इन दिस मेटाफिजिकल रिम ओनली वी कैन स्पीक ऑफ उपनिषदिक एथिक्स सो इट इज मोर मेटाफिजिकल इन नेचर the oldest upanishads say that the perfect sage is a saint who burns the evil away and he is free from evil so it is in the avoidance of evil we can see the clear moral teaching in the upanishads kata upanishad declares in its volumes 1 2 and 24 that he who is always impure is born again and again that he fails to reach the highest goal so we've been talking about it that we go through the cycle of birth and rebirth and death and that means our soul is still not pure we are still impure we hanker for the material happiness of this physical world and therefore we are born again and again and therefore we fail to reach the highest what is the highest goal according to the upanishad moksha or liberation from this cycle of coming again and again and both birth rebirth and death so we should be merging ourselves with the paramatman in the divine world good conduct is very much necessary for the attainment of man's metaphysical good so however upanishads also believe in good conduct which is necessary for the attainment of man's metaphysical good ethics in the dharma shastras and itihasa traditions let us look at this sub topic the institutes of manu or according to manu smriti and other dharma shastras are the main source books of both hindu ritualism and social morality the upanishads emphasize the liberation of the individual but the manu smriti subordinated individuality to social structures though individual one belongs to a family and a subcaste and he is always taken care by the family in which he is and so the hindu social morality is relativistic on several counts man's duties are accepted to be relative to time yoga and place desh so man's duties are accepted to be relative he has to perform according to his time or yoga and place or desh the duties of a person are also strictly related to his varna this we mentioned right in the beginning varna ashrama dharma according to your varna you are supposed to perform your duties brahman kshatriya vaishya shudra and there are other antajayas or jatis below the shudras as well so the duties of a person are also strictly relative to his varna and the stage of life varna ashrama dharma whether you are in the brahmacharya ashram or garhastha ashram or banaprastha ashram or sanyas ashram manu in manusmriti has decreed certain virtues as universal they are contentment dhairya forgiveness khama self control dhama non stealing asteya cleanliness shaucha coercion of the senses indriya nigraha wisdom dhi knowledge of the supreme atman vidya truthfulness satya and abstention from anger akrodha these virtues are common universal dharma or sadharana dharma which can be called morality so morality constitutes of the above uh, virtues such as contentment forgiveness self control cleanliness question of senses wisdom knowledge of the supreme atman truthfulness and abstention from anger so these are sadharana dharma everybody is expected to to practice these qualities which is basically the morality thus the dharma shastras epics and the puranas have their own specific goal but they seem to share more or less a common ethos from the point of ethics i hope this is clear that the dharma shastras epics and the puranas have their own specific goal it differs from each other slightly but they seem to share more or less a common ethos from a from the view point of ethics ethics or righteousness very very briefly because we are going to have another unit on bhagavata gita 
so today it's uh, very briefly we are going to talk about the ethics or righteousness in the Gita. The realization of the supreme reality through a life of righteous actions is the central well-knit theme of all the 18 chapters of the Gita. Actions are to be performed with the realization of Brahma Jnana. To attain the Brahma Jnana, one is advised to make a diligent search through devotion, renunciation and self-surrender. From attachment, desire springs, from desire wrath arises, from wrath comes infatuation. From infatuation, loss of memory and mind and finally from the loss of mind he perishes. So liberation from all kinds of bondages has to be there and it is possible. According to Bhagavad Gita, actions are to be performed without any attachment to the fruit of the actions. This is one of the means of attaining Brahma Jnana. So you are familiar with the famous shloka from Bhagavad Gita. You have right to your duty or actions. Actions are to be formed. But you have no right to its outcome or result of your action. That is what is meant by without any attachment to the fruit of action. This is one of the means of attaining Brahma Jnana. Thus Gita emphasizes both on Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga for the attainment of the supreme bliss but yet karma yoga is superior to jnana yoga. Here karma yoga simply means a mode of realizing the Brahman through devotional meditation on the name of God and practice of one's own duties without any attachment. So karma nivadi karaste maafaleshu kadachan. One will be blessed with Brahma Yoga which will lead him not only to moral success but also to the infinite spiritual joy and peace. So we see that both Karma Yoga is supposed to be superior in Gita to Jnana Yoga and Karma Yoga simply means a mode of realizing the Brahman through devotional meditation on the name of God. So, devotional meditation through bhakti, through complete, as Lord Krishna says, you surrender yourself to me. There is another way promoted by Bhagavad Gita to attain the ultimate realization in life and liberation from the cycle of births and deaths, which is known as karma yoga or path of activity. Gita has described this way as the method of disinterested action, maafale shukadachan. Take your action but without any interest in its outcome or in its fruits. Nishkama karma. To attain moksha, one has to be freed from the bondage to one's own action. So the Gita suggests the golden rule is that the actions should be done with the spirit of non-attachment to their fruits. Ma, Faleshu, Kadachan. Both the epics, itihasas, have a bundle of ethical and moral codes and injunctions as we can see, right? So both epics, itihasa traditions, that is the Puranas, as well as Bhagavad Gita have a bundle of ethical and moral codes and injunctions. Ethical concepts of Hindu tradition, doctrine of karma. Let's look at it. The doctrine of karma states that Whatever a man suffers or enjoys is the fruit of his own deed, a harvest sprung from his own actions, good or bad. Karma is of four categories. A. Sanchita karma which means accumulated past actions. B. Prarabdha karma which means the part of Sanchita karma. This results in present birth itself. This is also called predestination. C. Kriyamana karma which means present willful actions or free will. And finally, Agami Karma, which means the immediate results caused by our present actions. Karma simply means action and this karma must remind us that what is called the consequence of an action is really not a separate thing, but is a part of the action. It cannot be divided from it or cannot be separated from it. Let us look at the concept of transmigration of soul. The doctrine of karma and transmigration of soul are so closely bound up together. After the death of the body, life is of the individual is supposed to continue in another body and so on in indefinite series. According to this theory, the soul, though pure and blessed in itself, gets entangled in the samsara, that is cycle of birth and rebirth. 
It is because of karma it passes through innumerable births, transmigration before it goes back to its original state. What are the Purusharthas or supreme goals? We can go through it quickly. The dominant interest of Indian thought is in the highest value of human life. And these are four values. A. Dharma, B. Artha, C. Kama and D. Moksha. Dharma is usually distinguished into Sadharana Dharma and Varnashrama Dharma. Sadharana Dharma refers to duties of the universal scope and validity. There are ten cardinal virtues known as Sadharana Dharma. According to Manu, endurance, patience, self-control, integrity, purity and restraint of senses, wisdom, learning and truth, absence of anger or non-violence. The Varnashrama Dharma refers to duties of persons according to caste and stages of life. Thus, Dharma is considered to be a means value for attaining personality, integration and in the spiritual level or liberation. The term Artha generally indicates the attainment of riches and worldly prosperity, advantage, profit and wealth. Kama is a comprehensive term which includes all desires. The uniqueness of concept of Kama and enjoyment in the Hindu ethics is that all of them were to be related to the spiritual goal of human existence and so the Indian ethics insisted on a regulated enjoyment. In every school of philosophy in India, the first three Purusharthas are treated as instrumental values which directly or indirectly promote Parama Purushartha. Swadharma. What is Swadharma? By this term we mean each individual has to grow to his best according to his own dharma. That is to say the principle of individual growth is called Swadharma. Swadharma is in relation to an individual's temperament and stage and duties in life based on Varna and Ashrama. It is made in terms of three gunas, sattva, purity, rajas, virility and tamas, darkness. These three qualities are found in each individual in varying proportions and thus this varying proportion of qualities is regarded as the basis of different types of actions for the four castes. Varna Dharma. In Hindu ethics, we find Varnashrama Dharma as a social stratification based on the above gunas, profession and birth. Although theoretically it is justified to have such a classification of people in the name of their propensity and quality, they possess in terms of their attitude, caste system in Indian ethics remains an issue. By the way of profession, one's caste is determined in some ways both in theory and practice. Even if a person develops sattva guna and becomes a teacher of scriptures, he or she cannot become a Brahmin because of his or her birth. For the very reason that he was not born a Brahmin, although theoretically Hindu ethics preaches it, social mobility in such a practice remains only an utopia. A Shudra is always denied of the right of undertaking purificatory rite in the form of Upanayana or investiture of sacred threat ceremony. Stages of life of Ashrama Dharma. According to Hindu thought, the life was divided into four stages or ashramas, right? I will briefly go through it. The first is Brahmachari, studenthood, second is Grihastha, the householder, third is Banaprastha or forest dweller and the last is Sanyasi non mendicant. A man should pass through these stages regularly and no man should enter any stage prematurely. Finally, we come to Hindu rites or the samaskaras. So we are giving you a brief into each of the important concepts of ethics in the Indian philosophy. So sacrifices. Uh, form the central theme, uh, yagnas of the Brahmanical religion and philosophy. The sacrifices not only please gods but also feed them. Through them, the scenes are also atoned. The most important Vedic sacrifices are Srauta Sutras and Griha Sutras. Besides all these rituals, there are many personal or family sacrifices known as samskaras. These samskaras are religious acts for purification and they are the ceremonies for sanctifying the body, mind and intellect of the individual so that the person may become a full-fledged member of the community. I am just going to conclude important uh, sanskaras, Garvadhanam, Pumshavanam, Simantha Nayanam, Jatakarman, Nishkramanam, Anyaprasanam, Churakarmam, Vidyarambham, Vibaha, Anteshti among all. With that, we come to an end of this presentation on ethics in Indian philosophy, history of it with reference to the Vedic, Itihas Purana, Dharma Shastras and Bhagavad Gita. Thank you listeners and scholars for your patient hearing.